Where's your taco, mister? Whoops, fell in the fryer. I'll get it out. Oh, oh! Yeah, so skeptics want us to believe that Jewish scribes got together at some point in the past and said, you know this pagan epic that claims gods other than Yahweh rule? I think we should take this section where the wild humanoid sleeps with a prostitute and use them as our oldest known ancestors that were set up to rule as priests in God's sacred garden. Sound good, guys? And then everyone clapped. Hello and welcome. I'm Kip Davis, a biblical scholar and specialist in early Jewish literature, history, and the Dead Sea Scrolls. Today, I'm back to review another video by Michael Jones of Inspiring Philosophy, which explores the question, was Genesis taken from pagan legends? But I am not alone in this. I have a collaborator. Hello. My name is Mr. Burns. Okay, not so much. I'm Dr. Josh, an Assyriologist and specialist in ancient Near Eastern studies. I'm really excited to be here to engage with some of the ideas that appear in this video. In Jones's video, he attempts to argue that the story of Adam, Eve, and the serpent, the Nachash, is an original, independent work that does not exhibit any indirect or direct borrowing from much earlier and very popular Mesopotamian myths. The stories of Enkidu and the prostitute Shamhat, and Gilgamesh and Utnapishtim in the Epic of Gilgamesh, the Adapa myth, and the Sumerian Dilmun poem. In Jones's estimation, the difference between these texts and Genesis far outweigh any supposed similarities, and any that might be construed to exist can be explained as simply flowing out of a broad common cultural milieu. This case that Jones attempts to make is bewildering, misleading, and in the end strikes both of us as rather pointless. Dr. Kip and I will not be responding directly to every specific problem that appears within Jones's video. After all, we cannot really afford the time and energy to do this for hours upon end. In what follows, we have structured our critique into focusing on four problems with Jones's methodology. Which in turn completely invalidates his entire presentation. The first of these we will be discussing here are, one, his predictable tendency for well poisoning, two, his mischaracterization of scholarship and false dichotomies he draws between extreme positions, and three, his failure to define terms. The fourth problem is his terrible reading skills and consistent misunderstanding of ancient texts, which is something that we will tackle in a follow-up video. So without further delay, let's get into this. The title for Jones's video is, Was Genesis 2-3 Stolen from Pagan Legends? At the outset, we need to think about what he is communicating to his audience here. We understand stealing to be something that is socially and morally offensive. It's unethical. Using the word stolen as a means to describe the widely conventional literary activity of transcription, development, and adaptations of earlier traditions prejudices his audience to make a qualitative judgment about the phenomenon of what scholars call intertextuality. It anticipates the audience's rejection of this idea applied to the biblical text by positing it as unscrupulous in the first place. This is not just disingenuous. It is derogatory and completely misleading. But then, designating the competing ancient Near Eastern traditions and stories as pagan legends is pejorative. Pagan is primitive, it's non-Western, dark, and unenlightened. 
By designating the non-biblical sources in this manner, Jones has also inappropriately predisposed the Bible to a special category of literature at the expense of its cultural contemporaries. This is a clear sign that we are not dealing with an honest investigator. Jones falls into these habits of lazily prejudicing his audience to a preferred outcome, and some instances are more subtle than others. For example, Jones features two stories from the Epic of Gilgamesh that are widely considered by scholars to have variously influenced the narrative of Genesis 2-3, that is, the story of Enkidu and Shamhat the prostitute, appearing in Tablets 1 and 2, and the story of Gilgamesh and Utnapishtim at the end of the epic. He sets these stories against one another like this. A second and more interesting similarity is at the end of the epic. After Enkidu dies, Gilgamesh journeyed to the edge of the world where he meets Utnapishtim. Now, what makes one story or the similarities and differences between them more or less interesting is a matter of opinion. But I think Jones is either intentionally or ignorantly downplaying the obvious literary parallels in the story of Enkidu and Shamhat with Genesis 2-3. And we are going to get into those more specifically in the next video. To my eye, the most interesting parallels by far are to be found in the first two tablets of the epic. And the reason for this is how much these illuminate about the purpose and meaning behind the Genesis creation story in the first place. So, by calling the Utnapishtim section more interesting, Jones is priming his audience for a heightened expectation. And by possibly failing to meet it, this then appears to make his case. But of course, the most obvious and blatant instance in which Jones poisons the well in this video occurs in an outlandish caricature he has forged, intentionally or unintentionally, about how scholars imagine the function of intertextuality in antiquity. Do I even need to count the unnecessary assumptions this theory adds? Wouldn't a simpler explanation be that each culture had their own ideas that just happen to have some overlap? Jones's entire presentation of consensus scholarly views of the formation of Genesis comes across as ridiculous. But let's unpack this. First, he posits that Skeptics want us to believe that Jewish scribes got together at some point in the past and said, You know this pagan epic that claims gods other than Yahweh rule? I think we should take this section where the wild humanoid sleeps with a prostitute and use them as our oldest known ancestors that were set up to rule as priests in God's sacred garden. This depiction of ancient literary borrowing as so collaborative and complicit is completely disingenuous and seems to indicate that Jones does not understand this material. The rich metaphors which characterized all the ancient Near Eastern creation epics, including Genesis, were deeply entrenched within the cultural milieu, so much so that it required no planning or editorial committees at all to arrive at the obvious, clear similarities in imagery, theme, and language between several of these stories. Jones continues, Now this Enkidu doesn't make it to the end, guys. So let's also take this part about Gilgamesh swimming to the bottom of the ocean to find that special plant. Except we'll move the plant to the garden, turn it into a tree, and say it would allow them to live forever instead of just rejuvenating the body. And instead of the serpent stealing it, we'll just have the serpent talk to them to eat from another tree that they're forbidden to eat from. Also, we'll skip over the Bull of Heaven episode, the trip to Cedar Mountain, and all these other sections of the epic because I don't really want to include any allusions to these parts. Sound good, guys? As we will come to discover, this sort of hackneyed description of intertextuality is just blatantly misleading and fails to seriously address the phenomenon of borrowing in the ancient Near Eastern literature. The correspondences between obviously related texts are almost never made with point-by-point -point precision, but rather both function and succeed through clever and more subtle usages of imagery and language. We must recognize the intricacies with which the ancient authors both intentionally and unintentionally crafted their narratives. An ongoing issue throughout this, like 
many other of Inspiring Philosophy's videos is how he will assert a scholarly citation as an established proof of his claim, but never engages with many of the actual arguments. I have in the past accused Jones of disingenuously representing biblical scholarship and of gish galloping his way to faulty, grossly premature conclusions. And with this video, I stand firmly behind that charge. In addition, Jones will often set two extreme positions on a topic against each other and then create a false dichotomy by insisting that scholarly opinions must fall on one or the other end of the spectrum, making no allowance for them to fall in that vast, mushy middle where the consensus of scholarship is usually to be found. This is precisely what he does when discussing pan-Babylonianism. What exactly is pan-Babylonianism? Assyriologist Ben Foster defines it this way. It refers to a scholarly position taken by leading German Assyriologists and biblical scholars between 1890 and 1925, which held that ancient Mesopotamia had given the Hebrews most of their religion and civilization, including monotheism. The uniqueness and importance of ancient Israel was thereby denied. Jones provides a very rough sketch of the phenomenon, but then seems to incorrectly situate pan-Babylonianism as the operative model through which scholars continue to view intertextuality that occurs between ancient Near Eastern myths and Genesis. He quotes sentence fragments from an article by Mark Chevalis to make his point. The pan-Babylonians, however, were considered indiscriminate in their hypotheses, and most of their extreme ideas were rejected by both biblical and Assyriological scholars. Philologists began to show that the linguistic parallels were superficial. But in the article itself, even Shavala seems to use the term to refer to the extreme positions of seeing Mesopotamian myths as foundational for multiple cultures around the world, including Israel's. In other words, when someone says that pan-Babylonianism is no longer thought to have good explanatory power, I agree. The problem, however, is assuming that if scholars do not hold this extreme position, then they must conclude that the Hebrew Bible contains myths and narratives that are completely distinct from those of Mesopotamia, Canaan, or Egypt, or that the biblical texts do not use, respond to, or polemicize these texts from the surrounding cultures. This is not an either-or scenario, and for Jones to seemingly structure his discussion on these premises is misleading. Perhaps the most fundamental problem in Jones's video is in his failure to define terms and to communicate clearly what he's talking about when he wants to discuss borrowing in ancient texts. At several points in his video, he says things such as this. Scholars like Trigve Medinger and Jeffrey Tige have already looked into this and note there is little to no evidence the account of Adam and Eve was crafted by borrowing themes or stories from Mesopotamian tales. Just because we can find random and vague similarities in Genesis to things we can read in Mesopotamian literature, that doesn't mean there was a connection, let alone that the Hebrews constructed Genesis by borrowing from Mesopotamian legends. Given the differences between Genesis and Mesopotamian tales, it is unlikely Israel was borrowing from Mesopotamia when writing their account of Genesis 2-3. The Eden narrative is most likely a unique Israelite origin account. So the idea many of the biblical stories were directly or indirectly borrowed from Mesopotamian legends had a decent following about a hundred years ago, but today this theory seems to be a minority view. Most scholars do not think the biblical accounts were directly taken from or directly inspired by known Mesopotamian legends, and for good reasons. As is typical of Jones, this last one is a sweeping generalization made about how most scholars feel about directly or indirectly borrowed material from Mesopotamian legends in the Genesis primeval history, but without any discussion at all regarding the sources and demonstration of this claim. In particular, who are most scholars and what even constitutes borrowing in the discussion of comparative literature? 
What is the difference between direct and indirect borrowing, and how would we know it? Is there a set of criteria that Jones has employed in order to come to this conclusion? We are left wondering about all of these things, and without any further discussion or clarification, his entire presentation is rendered essentially meaningless. One of the signs of good scholarship is an attention to small details and a rigorous employment of language with careful thought to the usage of terms and their conditions. Jones exhibits none of these things. Jones would have done well here to cite the actual scholars who are actively promoting this idea about the independence of biblical stories. From just a small sampling of the several introductory texts we have on hand, it certainly appears to be not the case. The standard work by John J. Collins, Introduction to the Hebrew Bible, reports, uh, reading from the 2004 second edition, The biblical creation stories draw motifs from the myths of Atrahasis and Unuma Elish, and from the Epic of Gilgamesh. In short, much of the language and imagery of the Bible was culture-specific and was deeply embedded in the traditions of the Near East. In 2005, Philip Davies and John Rogerson wrote in the second edition of their Old Testament world, We know from the history of the composition of the Epic of Gilgamesh that ancient writers did indeed adapt and reuse older stories, and that once a new lengthy composition had been established, it could still be revised and added to. This is indeed the justification for investigating the sources behind Genesis 1-11. to But because we cannot identify the basic units used by the biblical writers, it is safer to content ourselves with comparing the motifs and themes of Genesis 1-11 to with those of other ancient Near Eastern texts. In this way, we acknowledge our belief that the biblical writers took over and adapted popular existing stories, while we confess our ignorance about the form and content of the actual stories that the biblical writers used. Michael D. Coogan's The Old Testament, a historical and literary introduction, second edition from 2005, says while speaking of the Genesis 1 creation story, the first account of creation in Genesis both employs and alludes to mythical concepts and phrasing, but at the same time also adapts, transforms, and rejects them. In Mark Smith's 2008 book, God in Translation, he writes, The Bible shows not only the development of an indigenous literary corpus in the local language of Hebrew, but also translatability of literary works or motifs into this vernacular. The Bible's authors fashioned whatever they may have inherited of the Mesopotamian literary tradition on their own terms. Finally, Victor H. Matthews and James C. Moore most succinctly summarize in their The Old Testament Text and Context, 3rd edition from 2012. The Israelites shared much of the worldview of ancient Mesopotamia. As a result, a great deal of material contained in the primeval epics in Genesis is borrowed and adapted from the ancient cultures of that region. Are we to believe that this tiny cross-section of Hebrew Bible scholars and ancient Near Eastern specialists just happen to be espousing a minority view? Or is it rather that Jones is both overstating his case and failing to qualify his bizarre, cherry-picked understanding of direct or indirect borrowing. When we consider the relationships between the various texts of the Hebrew Bible and their ancient Near Eastern predecessors, we need to be somewhat precise with the terms that we use. It is important to be clear about what it means for one text to borrow from another. Does this require conscious intent on the part of the composer? Are there varying degrees to which a text can be said to borrow from another? An excellent resource for delving into these types of questions is an edited volume by Zioni Zevit, published in 2017. The articles in the book deal with things like defining particular terminology when speaking about intertextuality, proper methods for identifying such relationships between texts, and specific test cases. For example, Drawing on the work of Ziva Ben-Porat, 
Joseph Kelly explains the four stages that a reader may go through when confronted with a text that is referring to an earlier text. In the first stage, readers recognize a marker that refers to an independent text. The second stage results in them determining which text is being referred to by the word, phrase, etc. The third and fourth stages involve the reader understanding how and why the writer is using this marker in the new text, ultimately viewing both the alluded to word or phrase in the new, broader context. A good example of this might be Genesis 6, where, read by itself, one might not see the significance of the rationale for Yahweh sending the worldwide flood to destroy all humanity. However, when read in light of the Mesopotamian traditions, it seems clear that the writer is telling the reader that, in contrast to Enlil, Yahweh is not evil, but morally justified in bringing the flood. This provides new meaning, negotiated between the text and the reader, for the broader context of the alluding text, Genesis 6 through 9. Let's focus in, however, on the first two stages in the experience of the reader, identifying the marker and determining which text it came from. How do we, as modern readers, attempt to determine where such intertextuality exists? Most often, a primary criterion is shared language, or things like words and phrases that are used in the alluding text that match those in the earlier text. But we can't just assume that when two texts have similar language, one must be referring to the other. Nevertheless, Kelly notes that things like rare or unique words or phrases, or an increased amount of overlap between two texts, strengthens the likelihood that one is utilizing the other. When verbal correspondence concerns unique lexical congruity, there are fewer explanations that would preclude literary borrowing. Consequently, unique lexical congruity represents the strongest form of reference than correspondence based on commonplace vocabulary. Additionally, Kelly spends some time distinguishing between an allusion and an echo. Earlier in the introduction, Zavit noted, A consideration of adjectives used to describe allusions suggests how useful allusion may be as a general term, but how useless it is when referring to a specific type of relationship between an alluding text and its alleged earlier target or inspiration. In other words, like borrowing, the word allusion while useful in some contexts, might be too imprecise a word for our purposes here. Citing the work of Benjamin Zummer, Kelly defines an echo as a situation in which, quote, the marked in the evoked text does not impact interpretation. In other words, if the alluding text draws on an earlier text, using a word or phrase that connects it to the earlier text, but the reference does not change the meaning of the new text, this is just considered to be an echo. However, if the use of the earlier text is employed for some rhetorical or strategic end, this would be considered an illusion. A few times in his video, Jones cites from David A. Carr's most recent book on the topic and introduces it as a foil for demonstrating the strength of his own ideas presented here. Jones at one point says, regarding the perceived differences between Genesis and the Epic of Gilgamesh, These are just a sample of many of the differences between Gilgamesh and the Eden narrative. As Carr has to admit, these contrasts are evidence that Genesis 2 and 3 does not simply mirror such non-biblical traditions on this point. At most, its treatment of the motif of humans unknowingly losing a chance at immortality is a distant echo of more focused treatments of mortality, such as that seen in the Gilgamesh epic. So this brings us back to the question of Jones's choice of definitions and also to the quality of his representation of dissenting scholars. For one thing, Carr speaks of the Genesis 2-3 text as an echo in contrast to a mirror, and in view of the relationship it has with the Epic of Gilgamesh and the Adapa myth specifically. But without knowing how 
Carr himself is using these terms, how does Jones even go about making conclusions about the level and types of intertextuality at work between the epic and Genesis 2 to 3? He never tells us. Instead, Jones is splitting hairs here by arguing against Carr's statement that Genesis represents a quite fluid adaptation of its Near Eastern precursors, by then suggesting that it's more likely Gilgamesh and Genesis only share similar themes and motifs because they share the same wider cultural background. So what is David Carr actually saying in these selections that Jones has cited? This paragraph appears close to a new section after which Carr has just laid out in pages and pages the quote, complex juxtaposition of multiple traditions often found separately in the Mesopotamian literary world, particularly the themes of human maturing toward adult civilization, for example, rulers of Lagash, debate between the sheep and the grain, Eridu Genesis, and the loss of a chance at immortality by a primal, semi-godlike human, Gilgamesh, Adapa, he goes on to explain the common concern that the Eden narrative shares with other Mesopotamian myths for agricultural work and its close connection to human creation. He points in summary to the observation that Genesis 2 and 3 has, quote, joined the motifs of Gilgamesh's and Adapa's loss of a chance at immortality on the one hand and the story of Enkidu's maturation on the other, through the theme of wisdom found in both. But then, Carr notes that, quote, there are important differences between Genesis 2 and 3 and the aforementioned Mesopotamian texts. He goes on to say that the themes connected to immortality and obedience or disobedience in the Eden narrative, Gilgamesh, and the Adapa myth are manifested differently, but that the way in which Genesis has combined them actually reinforces the relationship it shares with both of them. In this way, Carr says that, quote, Genesis 2 and 3 does not simply mirror such non-biblical traditions on this point. But then he goes on to say, despite these important differences, texts such as Gilgamesh and Adapa can help us appreciate the unique combined focus on wisdom and mortality found in the Eden narrative, the tree of knowledge and the tree of life, along with certain elements of the story, such as the presence of the snake, an animal that plays a role in those earlier narrative explorations of human mortality as well. Of course, Jones goes about making dismissive conclusions about the nature and extent of borrowing in the Bible from the Mesopotamian myths without ever actually engaging directly with the texts themselves. But we will get into that in the next video. Throughout most of his presentation, Jones instead makes incredibly naive assertions regarding similarities and differences between texts as a means to measure borrowing in ancient literature. As if simply counting similarities and Differences within the text on its own will determine where a text lands on the divide between borrowed and unique. On the contrary, and as Carr has pointed out, differences between one text and its borrowed contemporary will often illustrate precise, intentional editorial activity to provide correction or necessary adaptation of one story into another. But the best examples of intertextuality are usually those that are both subtle and unmistakable to the careful reader. For example, are the differences between the 1999 film, Ten Things I Hate About You, and William Shakespeare's The Taming of the Shrew enough to conclude that the former is an independent work, free of borrowing and adaptation? What about the 2000 film, O oh Brother, Where Art Thou? and Homer's Odyssey. If one has never seen Oliver Stone's controversial film JFK, will he or she even understand the structure and the arc of the two-part episode from Seinfeld, Season 3, The Boyfriend, in which Kramer, Jerry, and Newman debate the existence of a second spitter? Back and to the left. Back 
and to the left. Back and to the left. Back and to the left. Back and to the left. David Carr also contributed an essay to Zevitt's book and, utilizing the work of Christopher Hayes, cites several specific criteria that can be used to form a methodology for identifying intertextuality. One is availability. Was the proposed source of the echo available to the author and or his original readers? Another is volume. How loud is the echo? That is, how explicit or overt is it? Other criteria or the recurrence of the shared language and how well or poorly the shared language fits into the context of the alluding text. When the shared language does not fit well, this is referred to as a blind motif. Carr explains, A blind motif is an element or theme from a borrowed tradition appearing in a later text that does not fit well in the new context. This is actually quite strong evidence for intertextuality. I would like to take a few minutes to present a case of intertextuality that comes from outside the Hebrew Bible and is agreed upon by the relevant experts in the field. During the first half of the second millennium BCE, there was a myth, written in the Akkadian language, known as the Anzu myth. In the story, the god Enlil controls a magical item known as the Tablet of Destinies, which is stolen by a mythological creature known as the Anzu bird. After stealing the tablet, the Anzu bird flies off into the mountains and the world falls into chaos. The god An asks Adad to go and get it back, who replies, Who can assault an inaccessible mountain? Who of your children can Tevit Anzu? He has taken control of the Tablet of Destinies. He has snatched away supremacy from the god. The gods Giru and Shara are similarly approached and respond in the same way. Ea then volunteers to appoint someone to fight Anzu, and he sends Balat Ili to convince her son Ninorta to attack Anzu, and he agrees. Ninorta goes out and fights Anzu, and a fierce battle ensues. Ninorta shoots an arrow at Anzu, who, using the Tablet of Destinies, cries out, Shaft that has come, go back to your thicket. Shaft that has come, go back to your reed bed. In other words, because Anzu controls the Tablet of Destinies, he is able to control the world around him, and by speaking to the arrow, he can make it go back to where it came from. Thus, Ninorta cannot defeat Anzu. Ninorta then seeks advice from Ea, who tells him how to trick Anzu and defeat him. Ninorta is to fight Anzu again, and when the battle is at its height, and Anzu lowers his wings in exhaustion, Ninorta is to cut off Anzu's pinions. When Anzu calls for his feathers to return to him, using the power of the Tablet of Destinies, Ninorta is to shoot an arrow. Because the arrow has feathers on it as well, it will bring the arrow to Anzu, killing him. The trick works. While there's more to the story, these are the salient details for our purposes. However, I need to point out one of the repeated sets of lines that appears throughout the text that will be used when comparing the Anzu myth to Enuma Elish. When Balit Ili convinces her son to attack Anzu, she says, Let the winds bear off his wing feathers as glad tidings, to Enkur, to your father. These lines appear throughout the rest of the composition and form an important part of the text. Moving on to the Enuma Elish, a text that most likely dates to the second half of the second millennium BCE. Without going into all the details of the story, I would like to lay out the most important parts for our purposes. In the story, the sea goddess Tiamat determines that she is going to kill the other gods, and she creates monsters to aid her and gives the Tablet of Destinies to Kingu. A similar process is then undertaken to find a god to go out and fight for the gods against this new enemy. Anshar sends out Ea. Ea went to seek out Tiamat's stratagem. He stopped horror-stricken, then turned back. Anshar then sends a similar command to Anu, 
who responds in exactly the same way. Anshar then becomes angry and stops trying to summon gods to go to fight Tiamat. Ea then asks his son, Marduk, to go and speak with Anshar, and Marduk volunteers to go fight Tiamat. In other words, Marduk seeks out the battle where the other major deities have turned back in fear. Marduk ultimately prepares to fight Tiamat and her forces. The gods say to him, Let the winds bear her blood away as glad tidings. We'll return to this shortly. When Marduk approaches, we see, The Lord drew near to see the battle of Tiamat. He was looking for the stratagem of Kingu, her spouse. As he looked, his tactic turned to confusion. His reason was overthrown, his actions panicky, and, as for the gods, his allies, who went at his side when they saw the valiant vanguard, their sight failed them. The one who held the Tablet of Destinies was not only unable to defend himself from Marduk, but both he and his forces were defeated simply by Marduk's approach. Following the battle with Tiamat, Marduk completes his task. He cut open the arteries of her blood. He let the north wind bear it away as glad tidings. When his father saw, they rejoiced and were glad. What can we say about these two stories and how they relate to one another? In 1986, Wilfred Lambert published an article drawing literary connections between the Anzu myth and the Nume Leash. Other articles followed in a similar vein, including those by Peter Machinist, Andrea Seri, and more recently, Selena Wisnam. The conclusions that scholars have drawn agree that Enuma Elish is drawing heavily on the earlier Anzu myth, developing the story in such a way that Marduk is shown to be the new and improved Ninorta. Two significant points of comparison are the standard language that appears in both mythological texts and the presence and manipulation of the Tablet of Destinies. Earlier, we noted the call by the gods in the Anzu myth for Ninorta to have the wind carry the feathers of Anzu back to them to declare the victory over the bird. Similar, but not identical, verbiage is used in Enuma Elish, but with feathers being replaced with blood. Lambert pointed out that the language of wind carrying feathers makes sense, while wind carrying away blood is less consistent. He writes, wind easily picks up feathers, less easily blood. This likely example of a blind motif provides specific evidence for intertextuality between the compositions. Another point of contact and reworking is the Tablet of Destinies. In the Anzu myth, the Tablet of Destinies is a powerful magical weapon that enables the holder to control nature. Ninorta, the hero of the story, with all his power, is unable to directly defeat the one wielding such a weapon. However, in the Enuma Elish, the holder of the Tablet of Destinies is absolutely no match for the supreme power of Marduk. Not only does it fail to make Kingo a match for Marduk, it is completely ineffectual, as Marduk's power is overwhelming even before any battle takes place. In other words, the points of contact are clear between the two texts, but Enuma Elish uses these illusions in such a way so as to make a different theological point. We see this type of intertextuality throughout the biblical texts as well. A good example can be found in Isaiah 27 verse 1. The text reads, In that day Yahweh will punish with his sword, fierce, great, and strong, Leviathan, the fleeing serpent, Leviathan, the coiling serpent, and he will kill the monster in the sea. We see a nearly exact description in an incredibly popular composition from the late 2nd millennium BCE in the Canaanite city of Ugarit, known as the Baal Cycle. When you killed Leton, the fleeing serpent, finished off the twisting serpent, the seven-headed monster of the sea. When we compare the two passages, the verbiage that is used in each text corresponds to a high degree with one another. Specifically, the phrase Leviathan, the fleeing serpent, Leviathan, the coiling serpent, 
is nearly identical in both the Hebrew and the Ugaritic. The only difference between them is that the word for serpent in Isaiah 27.1 is the Hebrew Nahash, while in the Ugaritic text we see Batan, which is a cognate for the Hebrew Bashan serpent. However, the two words fleeing and twisting, that is the Hebrew Bariyah and Akalaton, are exactly the same as in the Baal cycle, Bara and Kalatan. Even the word Leviathan is the same, Hebrew Leviathan and Ugaritic Litan. Roberts writes, the sea monster motif is a loose quotation, ultimately derived from the Canaanite myth about Baal's battle with the sea monster. Passages like Isaiah 27.1, along with a host of other texts in the Hebrew Bible, lead scholars like Mark Smith to conclude. The political use made of the conflict between storm god and cosmic enemies passed into Israelite tradition. The biblical god is not only generally similar to Baal as a storm god, but God inherited the names of Baal's cosmic enemies, with names such as Leviathan, Sea, Death, and Taninim. See Psalm 74, 13-14, Job 3, 8, 26, 12-13, 41, 1, and Isaiah 25, 8, and 27, 1. It is with these features in view that we will consider Jones's appraisal of the sources in the next video and how the Genesis 2-3 Eden narrative may or may not show various levels of intertextual awareness and discrepancy on the stories of Enkidu and Shamhat and Gilgamesh and Nupishtim in the Epic of Gilgamesh, the tale of Adapa, and the Sumerian Dilmun poem. But for now, I think the audience can see with abundant clarity that he has not taken the same sort of care when comparing these ancient texts that scholars do, and which leads them to conclude that the intertextuality taking place between them is obvious, varied, rich, and dynamic. That's all for now. Until next time.